Okay, my good people, let us continue. I'm going to pray the Kondakion of uh, All Saints Week. The universe offers you the God-bearing martyrs as the first fruits of creation, O Lord and Creator. Through the Theotokos and their prayers, establish your church in peace. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. So you see in the Kondakion that the standard of being human is the martyr, right? The purpose of life is not to be a monk, not to be married, not to do this, not to do that. The purpose of life is be to become human. And all these things, these different callings, help us become human if we take them in the right way um, and not in an egotistical way. Okay, so today what I want to do is, is move on. And in order to be on time, I want to do this quickly. Uh, I try to make these things interesting and that's why I tried to give you all these PowerPoints and that's why it took a long, that's why the last lecture was late. So I apologize for that. Um, and I'm gonna apologize for this lecture ahead of time that it's gonna be more simple. I'm not, I don't have any PowerPoints for this one. So hopefully it'll be good enough for you just to listen to me. Hopefully I won't bore you. Okay, so let's um, pick up where we left off last time and really, um, what we need to say is, uh, leaving off from last time, the following. Remember we said that the central service is the Eucharist, okay? We explained what that is. And then this Eucharist, that within this Eucharist, we have this, the celebration of the Paschal mystery. This Paschal mystery celebration expands and becomes the whole liturgical year. And so we begin with the Eucharists being celebrated on Sundays, and on Pascha. And we said that the Johannine school, the school of, you know, the evangelist John, basically, and the, you know, the people who continued his tradition and ended up being the gospel of John, um, they celebrated, as we said, Pascha, uh, not on the Sunday after Passover, but on the Passover. Okay. And then eventually this uh, was accepted by the church eventually at the time of the first ecumenical council, uh, which explained the way in, not in the canons, but actually in the acts or the um, conversations around the, the council, the first ecumenical council that was held in year, the year 325 AD, um, that clinched or defined, let's say, the way that Pascha was to be celebrated in the church, okay? So taking this original 14 Nisan celebration in other words, they were more concerned with the actual date, 14 Nisan, rather than the fact that Christ was rose on, on a Sunday. Okay, so there's two ways of looking at it. You know, are we going to concentrate on the 14 Nisan or on the Sunday? So the compromise is that we um, take the Sunday after the 14 Nisan, Nisan, which is the in the Jewish calendar, the um, the the Passover, basically. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't explain that last time. Well, you know, I'm saying Nissan, and what that means, it sounds like it's Japanese or something like that, but it's actually uh, um, a terminology from taken from the Jewish uh, calendar, which was a solar calendar and a lunar calendar, okay, at the same time. So we can talk about that later. Okay, so we have the Eucharist, the Eucharist being celebrated only on Sundays and on Pascha. And eventually this Pascha ended up being on a Sunday also. And so we have Sunday and Pascha. And then you soon begin to see in the early church Sunday being expanded to Saturday. So we have Sunday, Saturday, and Pascha. And the reason for this is probably because the original Sunday celebration before the legalization of Christianity was an evening service, right? An evening service, like a vigil service, going from Saturday into Sunday, okay? But then when Christianity was legalized, people were allowed to celebrate on Sunday morning. But the idea of celebrating on Saturday was never forgotten, and Saturday was still seen as a holy day, you know, mentioned in Genesis as the seventh day, and also the fact that that's the day when Christ truly rested. In other words, that's the true Sabbath, this true Sabbath 
okay, when God rested from his work, is referring to the real work, which is the work of salvation wrought in Christ in the Passion, right? We talked about this in the first lecture, the fact that um, that's where the human being is really being formed, right? Uh, and our whole life, in a sense, is a Sabbath, okay? A Sabbath waiting for the eighth day, waiting for our entrance into the kingdom, okay? So this notion of Saturday as an, and as an anticipation of the day that goes beyond the seven, which what for the Jews was a perfect number, okay, uh, is still remembered. And so Saturday is seen as a holy day. So the Sabbath is um, also celebrated. So you see very early on in the church, uh, liturgies being celebrated every Sunday and every Saturday, as well as Pascha. And then Pascha begins to expand into all those things that are in the Pascha that we mentioned last time in the Gospel of John. We said that Transfiguration, Ascension, Pentecost, okay? The whole nine yards, the whole year is actually right there in that one mystery, but it begins to refract out and different aspects of this one single mystery are sort of like, how do you say, celebrated uh, individually, but the unity between them should not be forgotten. Okay, so uh, we have Saturday and Sunday, okay? And uh, another thing I want to mention about Saturday and Sunday is the fact that um, Saturday was seen as also a fulfillment of Put it this way, another reason why Saturday ended up being survive, surviving as a liturgical day and an important day is because of the early Jewish Christians that would somehow celebrate the Sabbath in a new way, with a new content, not concentrating on this idea of not working, but seeing it as a, a worshiping day, okay, a day dedicated to worship. Um, what they would do is the Jews would, you know, before Christianity, they would have a meal on Friday night, but before the setting of the sun, because the setting of the sun meant that it was actually Saturday, which means it was actually the Sabbath, which means they couldn't really cook their food. So they would have the meal before the setting of the sun. And so their meal was Friday night. And then on the Sabbath, they would eat cold food as it were. So what probably happened was in Christianity, um, some of the Jewish Christians, still kind of like connected with that old idea would end up having a meal on the Saturday night, which means after the setting of the sun of Saturday, that was already Sunday. So in a sense, it was something between Saturday and Sunday. And when Christianity was legalized and the Christians could celebrate their liturgy, you know, in the early morning, rather than it just being this night service because people were working, in other words, before the legalization of Christianity, people were working on Sundays, so they couldn't be celebrating, you know, liturgy in the, in, in the morning. So they would have to do it in the evening. So this evening service that was a Saturday-Sunday kind of celebration ended up becoming a Sunday morning service. But the Saturday celebration was never forgotten. OK, it stuck. And that's why we this eventually it broke up into these two both days being, in a sense, um, uh, liturgical. Okay, so this is one way of, of, of explaining the phenomenon that we have both Saturday and Sunday, but we're going to explain the meaning of all these days because as time goes on, each of these days ends up having a, a special meaning, all the days of the week. So that's when we get into the, the weekly uh, cycle. Um, but just for, for now, let's get into the, the development of the the daily office. So what I said last time was that you end up having uh, many different cycles developing around the Eucharist. So you have the daily cycle. Okay. What kind of prayers are you going to be doing every day in the church? Okay. The public prayers. We're talking about liturgical prayer, not private prayers, because obviously people are going to be doing their own private prayer rule because that's the preparation for coming into the congregation. You have to be prepared spiritually. So you know, the one hand washes the other, both are needed. You can't just have private prayer and not go to public prayer. You also cannot have just have liturgical or public or communal prayer and not private prayer. So these things work together. So uh, that's important to uh, important thing to note. In any case, 
we have the daily cycle, what the church was, a development of a daily cycle. We're going to talk about this right now. A daily cycle, a weekly cycle, a monthly cycle, a yearly cycle, and a movable cycle, and a fixed cycle. So we're going to try to explain what all these things mean. So this is the expansion of that one Paschal mystery into the whole year. That's what we're going to try to begin to explain, at least in a superficial way today. Okay. So first of all, the daily office. What can we say about the daily office? The daily office, in other words, praying in different times of the day was something that was sort of universal amongst all people, and especially the Jews. They had a daily a prayer rule or a daily uh, office, okay, a public office. You know, there was the temple in Jerusalem. They had their synagogues, okay? So certain uh, times of the day were dedicated to prayer. And the most natural thing in the world would be what? Well, when we wake up in the morning and we see that we have another day to, you know, somehow live out our calling in life, uh, what a gift, right? Uh, we thank God. So uh, certain times of the day were especially propitious. In other words, it means fitting for prayer. And especially we find the morning and the evening. And the main reason for this is the fact that the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun were very important natural signs for ancient peoples. This is something we've lost sight of because we don't really ever see the sun rise or set. And we're not so connected. We're, as modern people and technological people, we're disconnected, as it were, from nature. For those people, nature was their life. And the natural signs uh, were really, as I said before last time, there was no separation between church and state. In other words, all of life was seen in a, as a whole and in a sense as a whole connected with faith in God. And so um, the time of the rising of the sun, you know, the fact that God gives us another day and also the, the setting of the sun were, you know, to ask that, you know, there's darkness that, will not continue, in other words, that we will have another day the next day, okay? Both of these times um, were especially, how do you say, fitting and connected with prayer. And you see this even in scripture, where um, usually there's the, the idea of praying either seven times or three times, okay? There's no real standard, but you find that there was this idea that throughout the day, somehow we're going to sanctify time, Okay. And remember, these are services that are growing up around the Eucharist. So the Eucharist is the new thing that's totally unique. We're not talking about that right now because that's outside of time. Now we're talking about how every day we uh, sanctify actual time. Okay, so we find in uh, the Psalms, Psalm uh, 54, 17, in the Septuagint, a morning hour at morning and noon and at night, I cry out in distress and hear my voice. Okay, so this idea of praying three times a day. Or in Psalm 118, um, verse 164, okay, Psalm 118, by the way, is the longest psalm, right? The longest psalm in the Psalter, in any case. That's just a fun fact. Seven times a day, I praise you for your righteous law. Okay, so you... Yeah, what we see here is already this embedded in this in scripture, the idea that people were praying throughout the day. OK, so this is the sort of kernel or, uh, you know, uh, of what we call the daily office. OK, and also we find in Acts uh, verse uh, Acts chapter three, verse one, one afternoon, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. OK, so it is assumed that the early Jew Christians where Jews actually just simply con continued, you know, their original purpose was not to break away from Judaism. The original purpose was to say that, you know, Christ is a Jew and the true faith, the true, how do you say, fulfillment of Judaism is in Christ. Okay. And that's what they thought would happen. Okay. So they continued. In other words, they didn't make a break with the, the Jews because the Jews were the people of God. Right. And Christ came from them and Christ was the Messiah for the Jews and through the Jews, through the, for the whole world. So uh, they simply continued, the point I want to make is that they simply continued the um, prayer sort of like um, um, 
daily office the way it was in Judaism. So it says here that on the ninth hour they're praying, which means there are different hours of prayer. Okay, so that's important, important fact to to um, for us to hold on to. So what you see soon is that um, taking from what was already there, Christianity began to give to give what was there a new content because everything is interpreted. Everything is is interpreted in a new way. So remember, Saint Paul knew scriptures backwards and forwards didn't do him, him any good. If Christ doesn't open the book for you, if the church doesn't open the book for you, if you're not doing it in the community, um, he was persecuting the Christians, right? So um, so everything, everything depends on the way you read scripture. So St. Paul, when he saw Christ, he read scripture in a totally different way. It's like all these years I've been reading this and I didn't get it. Just like the disciples with, were, were with Christ for three years and they didn't get it. When he, they saw him on the cross, even though he told them that this would happen, they ran, right? Okay. Um, and even when they saw him resurrected, they still didn't recognize him, right? And the road to Emmaus. Who are you, stranger? Don't you know what happened in Jerusalem these days, right? Okay. We had this guy, Christ, and we thought he was going to free us from the Romans. They misunderstood everything. Okay. So uh, simply a reading is not enough. What you find in early in Christianity is taking the apparatus that already was there, the daily office of the Jews, and interpreting, uh, interpreting it in a new way, just like St. Paul in, interpreted scripture, the scripture that he knew so well, in a totally new well, new way in, in the light of Christ. Okay, so this is really what we have here. Okay, so this began before the legalization of Christianity, but even and after the legalization of Christianity, and when I say the legalization of Christianity, I mean in the fourth century with St. Constantine, where, you know, the Christians were not being persecuted anymore, and he was um, favorably disposed towards Christianity, okay? He didn't really abolish the other pagan religions, okay? But uh, he was not persecuting the Christians, and he himself was baptized on his deathbed, okay? So he was favorably disposed towards Christianity. You know, he called the first ecumenical council, but he wasn't really a baptized Christian yet. He was a catechumen. He was in other words, in a state of training, he was interested in becoming Christian, but he was not a Christian till the end of his life. So that's maybe another interesting fact, fun fact that I'm sure you probably knew. Um, so with the legalization of Christianity, we have a new situation where, first of all, the church was free to expand and to um, elaborate upon and expand her prayer life and her daily office and weekly office. And all these things began to expand and develop especially after the legalization of Christianity. So that's the first new thing that we find in this era, okay, when uh, Christianity was uh, legalized, okay? The second important uh, new thing that comes about with the legalization of Christianity is uh, the birth of a new type of prayer rule, okay? A parallel prayer, prayer rule. What am I talking about? The monastic rite. Before the legalization of Christianity, there was no real monasticism. There was no organized monasticism. There was no reason for it, right? Because in the early church, in other words, the whole point of, of life is not to become a monk or be married or this or that. We said it. We've said this so many times, but to be a martyr. So in the early church, everyone was a martyr, right? Just being Christian meant you're risking your neck, okay? And so people who are Christian were serious about being Christian, and um, they knew uh, really what they were doing, okay? Uh, once Christianity was legalized, however, there was a danger that Christianity could forget that radical newness. So Christianity has a continuity with Judaism, but also a radical newness. So, you know, you're going to find in the services and, and in the, the life of the church, uh, continuity and sort of like coming out of Judaism, but also there's going to be this new aspect and this new radical newness that's going to come from the revolution of this new way of life, saying that the way to become human is to become uh, a martyr. So that was, you know, uh, as it were, um, automatically the case before the legalization of Christianity. But after the legalization of Christianity, and I'm getting to number two, the new, the second new aspect that you find with the legalization of Christianity is the monastic rite. So the early monasticism, its purpose was to um, maintain that radical newness of Christianity. And the fact that the way to become uh, human is to become a martyr. Okay, so there are no more martyrs in a sense, right? Because the persecution stopped. And so 
monasticism wanted to, um, how do you say, to uh, preserve that sort of like uh, fresh newness and that aspect of Christian Christianity that says that to become a human being, you need to be a martyr. Again, not that the married people were not martyrs. Okay, so all calls, callings in life can be that. And, and um, but the monks in a more intense way wanted to safeguard against uh, the domestication of Christianity. In other words, once it's legal and you're not being persecuted, you can forget that aspect, okay? Whereas the monks were actually began on the fringes of the empire. So they were away from the centers of power. And in fact, they were even non-Greek. So um, non-central, non-Greek in the periphery, okay? The deserts, right? That was the original monastic monasticism. We've lost sight of this today because now we think that we identify monastics with the people who are in power, okay? In the early canons, it was incompatible for you to be even a priest and a monk, okay? A monk was a non-cleric because they went to monasticism exactly as a, um, how do you say, an exercise of uh, obedience and humility and, um, let's say, um, and a repudiation of power, okay? So it was, the, it was the opposite of power. Their power was in their powerlessness, okay? Uh, we've lost sight of this. It's something we could talk about uh, in another time. Um, so my power is made perfect in weakness, the folly of the cross. So that's really what the monks wanted to maintain, even though we said that this is what all Christians have to do, okay? In marriage, in you know whatever your occupation is, we are to do this. But the monks are a reminder that it's easy for us in any situation to um, lose sight of this, okay? So they wanted to preserve this. But the point I want to make is that we have two things going on here. With the legalization of Christianity, we have a liturgical rite and the development of the liturgical cycle that we're going to talk about that's in the world, okay? And the world meaning the cathedrals, the parishes, and so on and so forth. And then you have a parallel development with different needs, and that is to say the so-called monastic rite. So you have the cathedral rite in the world, in the parishes, and the monastic rite in the monasteries, okay? There wasn't a one-size-fits-all kind of like um, way of looking at things, okay? Uh, different needs for different people, different callings, different rituals, okay? Different liturgical uh, practices, okay? So you have uh, these two things, the cathedral rite in the world, okay? And the monastic rite in the monasteries, okay? And the monasteries were far away from the centers of power. They were typically not urban. They were in the deserts, okay? And uh, bishops were not monks, okay? The early bishops were married, but even if they began to not be married, if you were a, a bishop, uh, you are the president of the Eucharistic Assembly, right? So you're not under obedience, whereas a monk has to be under obedience. So that's the definition of a monk. It has nothing to do with whether you're married or not, okay? Because just being celibate is not being a monk, by the way. Being a monk means living in a monastery, okay? We have the wrong idea today that we identify celibates with monks, okay? They're celibates in the world and they're serving in parishes. That's not what a monk does, okay? So this distinction was very clear in the early church, and that's why I'm, you know, telling you this, that because it seems surprising to you because this is not the case anymore today. These ha things have been muddled, and mixed up, okay? And that's why sometimes we're a little bit sch schizophrenic in the church and we get confused about these things. Something we could talk about. Okay, cathedral rite in the world, monastic rite in the monasteries, and these different, two rites had different, uh, character. Why? The cathedral rite for the world was more um, interested in the participation of the people. In other words, the people were working in the fields. Okay, so when they were coming for prayer in church, that was valuable time and limited time that they had to be there. And so that they had to make the most of the time. So that time would be something very positive and very extroverted and very participatory, okay? In other words, we talked about all kinds of processions and entrances and so on and so forth, that all the people would be involved, okay? So this was the, the, the sort of like um, the hallmark of the cathedral rite. It was extroverted, outgoing, as I said, emphasizing popular um, participation and singing and so on and so forth, okay? A lot of hymnology, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> Whereas the monastic rite was more 
cloistered. Why? Because it had a special purpose for a special calling, for a special category of people. They voluntarily went out there, okay? So this is not something that was forced on them. And so uh, the monastic way of, of, of uh, doing the monastic rite originally, so this is not the case today, okay? We're looking at some, two different things that ended up becoming one, and that's what we have right now is kind of like a hybrid of both, okay? We'll talk about that. Um, but uh, originally, um, the monastic rite was interested in being within a cloistered area, right? within the walls, right, of the monastery. The purpose was to be in the desert, to be in your monastery and devoting the whole day to prayer. That was your work. That was your main job, right? So uh, we have two ways of looking at scripture, okay? So in the cathedral, right, uh, especially the Psalms were used, but they were used according to the time of the day. In other words, they were not read in order, as it were, right? Rather, they were read, um, the structure of the services that developed were structured upon the sort of tenet or principle that um, uh, psalms would be chosen according to uh, the appropriateness or how the connectedness with the time of day. Whereas in the monastic rite, the idea was to go through all of scripture from A to Z, right? In other words, especially the psalms, they would just be read in order, okay? So um, you have this, okay. Truth of, truth of the matter is that even in the cathedral, right, there were certain sections that we had a rotating reading where you end up going through all of scripture, in other words, all of the Psalms. So the Psalms, the Psalter, was very important for both of these rites. Okay, um, let's talk about what services were actually um, celebrated. So we're talking about the daily office. The daily office for the cathedral rite would be, like I said before, the most sort of like appropriate times for prayer would be morning and evening. So the original services that evolve, remember, the original service of Christianity, the unique service of Christianity is the Eucharist. We're not talking about that now because that's outside of time. OK, that's the goal. But to get to the goal, you have all these other services that were, were, were developing around the Eucharist. OK, and so the Eucharist would not be celebrated every day mainly on Sundays, we said, Saturdays, and Pascha, and eventually Pentecost, and other uh, dominical or feasts of the Lord originally began to very early to expand and to develop, um, all, again, coming from the one Paschal mystery of, you know, eventually, in other words, actually Pascha, from Pascha. Okay, the basic rites of, the basic services that the cathedral rite would have would be Vespers and Authors, okay, very simple, okay? On special days, uh, like Sundays and Pascha, you would also have divine liturgy, right? Um, and we'll talk about the fact that, especially in the cath the um, cathedral rite or in the the way it was done in Constantinople, the services, there would be plenty of stational liturgies. What does that mean? It means that you would have people would know to start in one station, one place, and then they would process through the streets and stop for prayer and then continue the procession as they were chanting the Psalms, okay, with refrains that all the people could, you know, uh, join in on, okay, and then they would eventually end up in the church and there would be the divine liturgy. So there might be something like this, an author service somewhere, and then a procession to another church, okay, and then the divine liturgy, okay. But the basic services were these uh, Vespers and Orthros on any given day, and on special days, also the Eucharist, again, not being part of the daily office or part of time, but beyond time, okay? Uh, but on um, certain times of the year, you would have, together with Vespers, after Vespers, you would have a vigil called the Panichis, okay? The Panichis, a vigil service on the eve, after Vespers, on a special day, according to this cathedral rite. And then this would be followed in the morning by Othros and the Trithecti service, okay? The Trithecti service is the service of between the third and the sixth hours, okay? So on special days, you would have Vespers, Panichis, Othros, Trithecti, whereas on normal days, you simply have Vespers and Othros. Fine. That is the cathedral, right? Um, and I say 
Vespers first and Orthros because Vespers, from Vespers you count the next liturgical day. So this is following Genesis 1-5 and the evening and the morning were the first day, okay? So the Jews measured time from sunset to sunset, okay? Whereas the Romans, you know, uh, measured the days from midnight to midnight. In any case, different ways of measuring time. Okay. The development of the monastic rite, and specifically the monastic rite in the monastery of St. Sabas in Palestine, okay, near Jerusalem, uh, is very important because this ended up becoming a very important rite that ended up spreading, monastic rite that spread to other monasteries, specifically because it eventually spread to, in the ninth century, the a monastery, the monastery of Studios, a, mo a, a urban monastery, a monastery in the uh, capital in the city of Constantinople, and this this form of the monastic rite, because again, they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have internet, they didn't have telephones, so there would be a variety, okay? They wouldn't be just like one service, one orthodox service that's, that falls from the sky. Remember, we're talking about real human beings, which means there's variety and difference and change, and that was totally legitimate in the early church. There was no need to have everyone conform to one one norm, okay? These things developed uh, from in a grassroot, grassroots, organic kind of a way. Okay, so I say that the the um, the monastic rite of Saint Sabas was very important because this ended up giving us what we have today. We don't have today a cathedral rite and a monastic rite, but we have a one size fits all. We have a hybrid of the cathedral and the monastic rite. Okay. Um, and basically the original hybrid of these two rites what happened in Constantinople, and this is the so-called Studite rite from the ninth century till about the 13th century. And then in 1204, you have the uh, Fourth Crusade and they sacked um, Constantinople. And this kind of like put a big dent in the cathedral rite that was being done, being done in the world, right? And eventually the monastic rite came out stronger because it, is more user friendly, friendly in the sense that you don't need so so much manpower because the cathedral rite needs everyone, deacons, priests, you know, deaconesses, you know, lay people, and so on and so forth. So um, finally, in in the last period, uh, the second sort of like synthesis of the monastic and the cathedral um, that was forged basically in Mount on Mount Athos. Okay, and basically that's what we have today. So our services today, whether in the world or in the monasteries, are basically the same. So let's talk about what is the daily office according to our um, tipikon, okay? That is basically coming from the basic uh, um, daily office of the St. Savas Monastery that was so influential for the student, right, in Constantinople, and from there it spread everywhere, okay? And especially after the crusaders, like I said, killed the, the cathedral, right, basically. Um, so what do we have? We have um, eight different services. Okay, so the, the, the daily office is as follows. You have Vespers, Compline, Midnight Service, Orthros, First Hour, Third Hour, Sixth Hour, Ninth Hour. You notice that liturgy is not included because liturgy is not part of the daily office. Okay, so don't put it in there. The fact that monks later on ended up having daily liturgies, okay, uh, is a specific characteristic of their way of doing this, but it, it still is not a part of the daily office. It just happens to be there, but that is the arrival, that is the outside of time, that is the beyond time, right? So everything is a procession from time to the eschaton, okay? And the eschaton is that liturgy where we actually are participating in communion with the, the kingdom of the end times. Okay, so Vespers, Compline, Midnight Service, Orthros, First, third, sixth, and ninth hours, okay? Um, by the 15th century, Simeon of Thessaloniki laments the fact that even in Constantinople, the cathedral rite is not being celebrated anymore, which means that this uh, hybrid rite of monastic and cathedral that we have today basically already took over. And so these services were, were being celebrated. Okay, let's talk about the themes of each of these services. So Vespers, the Vesper service is the kernel of the Vesper service. It's really based on the uh, lighting of the lamps in the evening connected with 
prayer. Okay, so the Jews would do this and in their tents, you know, during Exodus and so on and so forth, there's all kinds of description of this. Um, they would do their evening prayers. They would light the lamp in their tent, okay, so they could see the prayers, okay? And so um, this was the original sort of like kernel of Vespers, uh, the lighting of the lamps in your house so you could see, right? So everything that was done, again, had a faith-based uh, meaning, okay? So this another theme, the sun sets, but we await the true life, the true light of Christ. For in Christ, there is no end, and no beginning. And all these things are hearkening again to the final day of the kingdom. Okay, so that's Vespers in a nutshell. Uh, next, we have Compline. Compline in Greek is called Apoditno, which means after dinner. So this is something that's connected, especially in a monastic rite. In the original monastic rite that it came from, it was connected with, um, you might say, uh, the. It literally literally means apodigno after supper. So, after vespers in a monastery, say, so the original context of these, of this sort of ordo or this, um, you know, set of services, the original order would have been vespers is done, first service, and then the monks sit down at trapeza to have their dinner. And then after dinner, they pray the compline service, okay? And the main themes of the compline service is thanks for the day that has passed, protection throughout the night, asking for protection throughout the night, and finally, forgiveness for wrongs done, okay? The next service is the midnight service. And the theme of the midnight service is the resurrection because of the, the belief that Christ resurrected in the middle of the night. And also the belief that the second coming will be in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night. Um, so the major theme of this service is vigilance because you have to be ready for Christ to come again. And also uh, the notion of the end of the old, the beginning of the dawning of the new day, right? So the end of darkness and the light begins to appear, okay? So um, the symbolism of midnight is important, to, connected with light out of darkness and um, this sense of life out of chaos. But the main theme is vigilance, and that's why, you know, the hymn that we sing during Holy Week, uh, Behold, uh, the bridegroom is coming in the middle of the night. You do on nymphios erkete and the mesotis niktos. We think that that's connected with Holy Week, but it's actually something that is read as a prayer throughout the year in the midnight service. Again, the emphasis is on uh, vigilance. Okay. And then uh, the Orthros service. Orthros is a service, obviously, that is celebrated at the rising of the sun. Actually, originally, the original Orthros was actually before the rising of the sun. So it almost was like you know, a very early morning service. In any case, uh, at the rising of the natural sun, it is natural to contemplate the coming of the true light, which is Christ, into darkness. Okay, so that's the main theme of Orthros in a nutshell. And then the hours. Why do we have hours? Because in those days, you know, the monks and everyone else, they were not wearing Rolex watches. So the only way that they could figure out what time the, of the day it was, in other words, how they could... Uh, you know, um, divide the day or designate time uh, was through uh, bells throughout the day or the so-called so town choir, okay, that you, you might know about in medieval times, okay? Uh, that would be a way of dividing the, the day into certain pieces that you kind of like know where you are, okay? So these divisions were, were as follows. Basically, they were the first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour. Okay, what does that mean? First hour is about 6 a.m. So let's take the ideal situation, which would be what? The spring equinox. In other words, the, the first day of spring and the first day of fall, that's when um, the day has 12 hours and the night has 12 hours, which means day begins at 6 a.m. First hour, ninth hour is, the third hour is nine, is nine o'clock, right? Six, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Uh, okay, first hour, Third hour is nine o'clock. Uh, sixth hour would be 12 noon. 
and the ninth hour will be three o'clock p.m. Okay, and then so these uh, service these services of the hours were uh, done throughout these uh, hours of the day originally. Even though now, even in monasteries, they pack them all together rather than doing them throughout the day. In any case, that's a story for another day. Uh, each of these hours have their own theme. The first hour is the coming of the true light. Okay. The third hour is the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So this is commemorated every day. Okay. So in a, in a sense, every day is kind of like, you know, again, the whole Paschal mystery. Okay. The whole nine yards. Okay. First hour, coming of the true light. Third hour, descent of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. Sixth hour, the cross and passion. And ninth hour, death and burial. So you see how every day these, uh, you know, aspects that we celebrate also throughout the year are but I actually boil down to the one Paschal mystery um, are celebrated okay okay that's the daily office that's the daily cycle now we can get into the weekly cycle so we're, we're quickly going to talk about the weekly cycle and the weekly cycle is basically what do I mean I mean how each day of the week okay you know Sunday Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they all have their own symbolisms and their own meanings. So every week we go through this again and the, these uh, important symbolisms are, are reminded. Okay, first of all, Sunday, Kiriaki Mera, the day of the Lord, the first day of the week, okay, as we read in the scriptures, when Christ was resurrected, the day of the resurrection, even though in early church it seems that, you know, Pascha was specifically seen as the day of the resurrection, whereas Sunday was seen uh, as um, commemoration of the new creation and the eighth day. Okay, so we have uh, the Sunday, which is beyond the perfect seven of the week that we read about in Genesis. You know, the seventh day uh, God rested, okay? And I think, again, that's a sketch for the real rest, which is Holy Saturday, when Christ, when God really did rest, okay, from his works. But that rest, again, was not a rest of idleness, but a rest of making the human being, right? Okay. Um, okay, afterwards, the idea and notion of the eighth day and the new creation was combined with the resurrection when Pascha ended up being on a Sunday. Okay, so Sunday is not to be seen as a Christian Sabbath or the Christian version of what the Jews had on Saturday, Okay. Sunday is a thing in and of itself. And the Saturday, the Sabbath, is not erased. It also has its importance, as we're going to see in a second. So Sunday is not a new Sabbath, but a new heaven and earth. Okay? And it's seen as the day beyond the Sabbath. Tide mia ton sabaton. On the first day of the week, or on the first day after the Sabbath. One day after the Sabbath. Okay, so that's the way this can be um, um, translated. So uh, again, Sabbath still has its identity, but Sunday is seen as going beyond the perfect Sunday of the Sabbath. And that's why uh, it is connected with the so-called eighth day. And that's why we have eight modes, okay, that we chant in our churches. Uh, in other words, the symbolism of the eighth day, the, the day of the resurrection, the day of the kingdom. And besides this, we also have um, um, eight-sided baptistries in the ancient church, okay? So all these things are hearkening to the final day of the kingdom, the day of the unsetting sun, as it were, right? Okay, okay. And we're not going to talk about the the for, Porto decimin, deciminist controversy in Asia Minor. We talked about that already, okay? That the original uh, Pascha was not on Sunday, and then it got connected with Sunday, and that kind of like completed this whole uh, symbolism in a very good way. Okay, Sabbath, Saturday. Saturday is still imbued with a special meaning, and it is seen, again, as the day when Christ was in the tomb, okay? And therefore, Saturday becomes a commemoration for all the dead, all throughout the year, not only on Psycho Sabata, but that's why we have the Saturday of Souls on a Saturday. And even our funeral service is actually based on the authors of Saturday. So the auth a normal Saturday authoress is different than other authoresses, okay, even though we rarely do a real Saturday authoress, and it is connected with Holy Saturday, uh, but also all 
funeral services are actually derived or based on the Saturday Orthros because in our funeral, we want to die, uh, we want to be incorporated into the life-giving death of Christ, okay? The Paschal mystery again. So Saturday in this sense is seen as, you know, when Christ is in uh, the womb or the tomb, the tomb, which is a womb because he's actually you know, born, okay? Through the, the cross and the death, okay? We learned about this last time. Uh, this is really the starting point of history, right? This is really the conceiving of everything, the whole Paschal mystery, the whole liturgical year. And therefore, the first Nisan, the first uh, uh, the first Pascha, put it this way, happened to be, in other words, we said it was on 14 Nisan to 15 Nisan, that Holy Saturday, the, the Holy Saturday when Christ was in the tomb, it happened to be that that year, because of the way the moon and the sun was, it happened to be the 25th of March. So that being the spark that started everything, that is seen as the womb, okay? The tomb is actually the womb, okay? That cave is the womb, and therefore the whole thing starts from there. So that's the starting point of history, in a sense, and therefore six, nine months after that first Pascha, which happened to be March 25th, you know, it fluctuates every year. It's different, just like Pascha is every different. So for the Jews, their Passover fluctuated just like our Pascha, you know, um, fluctuates. That year it happened to be the 25th of March. And therefore, nine months after the 25th of March is December 25th. Okay. So the conception, okay, the beginning of everything happens in the tomb, which is the womb. And then nine months after that, you have you know, the nativity. So the nativity is, in a sense, an afterthought, okay? Everything is seen backwards in God because, again, you have the original, okay, the stamp, and then everything else that we see in history, in a sense, is, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the type, okay? Uh, so the point I want to make is that the starting point, again, is the Paschal mystery. So you have certain hymns, especially from Holy Saturday, that really give us the meaning of Saturday. Come, let us see our life lying in the tomb, that he may give life to those that in their tombs die. O happy tomb, it received within itself the creator as one asleep. Okay? And the so-called icon of Holy Saturday would be the icon of the that is seen in some churches where you have Christ in the heavens, and at the same time, he's in the grave. All things above and below quaked with fear at your death as they beheld you, O oh my Savior, upon your throne on high and in the tomb below. Okay? So really, Saturday, always throughout the year, not only Holy Saturday, all Saturdays are, how do you say, connected with Holy Saturday, and therefore um, they are a commemoration of all the dead. Okay. Okay, the rest of the days, and maybe that's enough for today. We're just going to, so we've gone through the daily office and the weekly office, and then we're going to continue um, the next lecture on the um, monthly, yearly, the movable, and the fixed feasts, and how the, all these things expand and give us the um, uh, whole liturgical year. In um, the English language, the days still have the pagan names, okay? Sunday, day of the sun. Monday, day of the moon. Tuesday, uh, day of Tiu, the Germanic god of war, or in Roman, uh, in Latin, Martis, Mars, okay? Greek, Aris, okay? Wednesday, Wodnes Day, again, Germanic, uh, the day of Odin or Woden, the supreme god, or for the Romans, Mercury, right? That's why in French, you know, Mercredi, or in Italian, uh, Merzoledi, right? Uh, Thursday, Thor, the Germanic god of thunder, or for the Romans, Jupiter, okay? Um, that is to say, Zeus or Dios, right? Uh, Thursday, Friday, 
Frigga, the wife of Odin, okay? Uh, again, or uh, the day of Venus, okay, for the Romans, Venerdi, Ven Ventredi, right? Okay, uh, Aphroditis, that is to say, Venus for the Greeks. Um, but for the Jews, the day of preparation. Saturday, the day of Saturn, okay? Okay, so in English, the sort of pagan substructure is retained, whereas in a lot of the Romance languages, um, it has changed where Sunday is the day of the Lord, right? Dimanche, right? Uh, Domenica. Um, whereas um, uh, some of the other pagan names are retained for the weekdays, but you have in Greek that all the pagan names um, are gone and everything is based on what? All the names of the days of the week are, are based on the, uh, the coming of the Lord. In other words, on Sunday, using Sunday and counting from Sunday. So we have, um, you know, Kiriaki, the day of the Lord, and then Bethera, the second day. So the Sunday is the first day, okay? So everything changed with Christianity, especially in, let's say, the East. So in Russian, in Greek, in most Orthodox languages, <clears throat> you have, uh, you know, the the names of the days of the week being based on you know uh, accounting from the day of the Lord. So you know Triti, uh, so Bethera, second day, Triti, third day, Pempti, fifth day, Paraskevi, day of preparation. Okay, and then Saturday, Savato, the Sabbath. Okay, so the Sabbath is still there, but it's given a new meaning, a new Christian meaning. Right, um, that this is the Holy Sabbath, right? Remember from Holy Saturday, uh, where Christ rested in the tomb, and this is what everything was that was written back then was referring to in, re, in, in a sketch form. Okay, okay, so what do each of these days of the week symbolize? Because in this new Christian way of looking at the, in the Orthodox way of looking at the days of the week, they each have a meaning, and we already talked about. Sunday being the day of the Lord, right? In other words, the day of the resurrection, okay? The eighth day, the day of the unsetting sun. Saturday, we said, is, you know, the, the new Sabbath, right? Which is actually referring to all the dead, um, commemorating all the dead, because we want to connect all our dead, and we want to die connected with the life-giving death of Christ, because he was in the tomb on the Saturday, right? On the Sabbath, and that's the real meaning of the Sabbath, rest right? Being in the tomb, which means totally giving yourself up to God so you can be created by God. So it's the day of the creation of the human being in that sense, right? Uh, Monday is dedicated to the angels, okay? Tuesday is dedicated to St. John the Baptist and all the prophets. Wednesday is, the, is a fast day, and it's the, dedicated to the Theotokos and the cross, okay? Thursday is is dedicated to the apostles and Saint Nicholas. Every Thursday throughout the year is dedicated to the apostles and Saint Nicholas. Okay, not only Saint Nicholas Day, you know, in December, but he's also celebrated, celebrated every Thursday of the year. Why? Because he's seen as the perfect example of a successor of the apostles, what we're all supposed to be, but especially what bishops are supposed to be. He loved children, you know, he took care of the poor and so on and so forth. So he's celebrated every Thursday as an example for us. And then Friday, again, is a fast day. And so we celebrate again the Theotokos and the cross. Why Theotokos and cross? Because Theotokos and the cross are both examples of self-emptying, of becoming truly human, right? Of laying your life for the other, because that's exactly what Christ, what Panagia did. She gave space for God, right? She said yes to the plan of God. And that's what ultimately is the goal for real human life. Okay, so those are the days of the week. And I'm going to just end this lecture by saying the following, that the hierarchy that you find in the week is the hierarchy you find in the whole church building. Okay, what am I talking about? Well, obviously, Christ is first, Sunday, Lord's Day. Okay, and after Sunday, you have Monday, where the angels are celebrated. And under the dome, first of all, on the dome, you have Christ, right? The Pantocrator. Okay, that's the most prominent thing you see in the church, the highest thing. And under that, you have the angels. Under that, you have what? Usually the 
the evangelists or the apostles. So remember, we said that Monday is the angels, Tuesday is the uh, the prophets. Oh, sorry, we, we forgot someone. So under the angels, okay, Monday, you have the prophets, Tuesday, okay? And then um, Wednesday and Friday are the cross and the Panagia. The Panagia is really, so they get two days because they're more important because the whole church is shaped like a cross. And of course, that's the Paschal mystery, right? Remember the early resurrection icon was the crucifixion, right? Because it's trampling upon death by death. It's one mystery, not two things. It's not like on the one hand, you know, Christ uh, uh, as a human being, he died, okay? But because he happened to be God, he also got out of the grave because that would be make him two people. That would be a Nestorianism, okay? So it's one mystery, one person. Within one person, through death, he conquered death. Not the human part died over there and then the divine part, you know, came to life, okay? That would be two different people. We're saying it's one, okay? So every Wednesday and Friday, this is celebrated. And that's why it, it, it's, it's, it's um, a celebration of self-emptying, right? And the most prominent thing we find in church is the Panagia, okay? The example of self-emptying and above the apse of the altar. And also the whole church is actually say, shaped like a cross. So we have Wednesday and Friday, Panagia and cross. Very important for, you know, the structure of the church. And then uh, uh, Thursday is the apostles. And usually on the dome mm -hmm. under the prophets, you would have the apostles or the evangelists, okay? And then finally, uh, Saturday is specifically all the martyrs, first of all, and then all the ascetics and all the other categories. So they, they go in this, this exact same order uh, when we do our prayers. And, the you know, the deacons do the special intercessory prayer in, the, in some author services. Whenever there's a gospel in the author service, when it's a festal author, they have this huge prayer that they do. So, so, no, theos, ton laon, su, kev, logis, on, di, ten, ramia, su, et, pis, kev, se, ton, cosmon, su, en, elei, kek, temis, Ipsun keros, Ipsun orthodoxon, Ekatab Ipsun efima, Estale suta plusia, Presbies panacrando de spinis in Montel. Okay, then you go through the whole thing. Panagia, so you already talked about Christ. Okay, then Panagia, cross, okay, um, you know, uh, angels, right? Uh, and so on and so forth, all in the same order we just said. Okay, so the whole week, the structure of the church, our prayers, our dismissals, they all have this sort of hierarchy, okay? And so um, we are being in church and in our liturgical life, we are being incorporated into this narrative, okay? This narrative is the life-giving narrative. This narrative is the narrative that, you know, uh, is our womb that makes us human, that forms us, okay? So everything that's done in the church is trying to do this. That's the whole purpose. The purpose is to make us finally human, to make us martyrs, to make us learn how to lay our life for the other. Okay, I think that's good enough for today. Um, God bless you. I look forward to seeing you very soon.